In terms of my background, um, I worked a lot in the enterprise space over the last few years. So I can really relate to the needs of bigger customers and how they approach the web API world and, and puzzling it out. You know, I, I try and work with the enterprise space and mobile as well, the entrepreneurial space. So hopefully I can provide that kind of bridge between the two sides. What I wanted to talk about today was, you know, some principles of API design, but within the perspective of things that have come before this, right? And I think it's important because when I talk to people about API design and web APIs, often I, I feel like this is what they're seeing in their head, right? An exciting, young, you know, party scene with startups and hackathons, people coding all night. Silicon Valley and London Tech City, you know, a real disruptive, change the world environment. And this is especially appealing to the guys who are in an office all day, right? So they come to the hackathons to, to really be part of this world. And I think there's truth in this, right? The, the openness of APIs, integrating systems could really mean a big thing for us. But I think also what happens is there's a, a disillusionment that occurs. When people start to look at the technology that underpins this, right? So we get all excited about look at Google and look at APIs and you go back and you talk to the development team or you talk to the architect who's been in this for 15 years and he kind of smiles knowingly and says, well, you know, we've been doing this for so long already. You're just rebranding it. All you're doing is, uh, coming up with a new term to sell new software, right? I think there's a grain of truth in this as well. We are using technology that's existed for a long time, right? We're not saying that web APIs are a, a way of doing <laughs> things like no one has done before with technology that's never existed. But there's something to this, right? There's a, a new viewpoint that has emerged from the web API space. And to me, this, this is what can capture our imagination as technologists, right? And if you're facing this kind of resistance, it's, it's really helping someone to understand this bottom-up, this organic view of integration uh, that I think is that last piece for someone who's been in the technology business for a long time to understand the power here, the power of APIs. And I don't think they have to be open. Right? I think open APIs are powerful, but the reality is that there's so many closed APIs. And if there's so many closed APIs, is there any benefit for them? Do they get anything out of all of this stuff we're talking about? So to understand that and to help emphasize this point I'm making about a different perspective, uh, I'd really like to take a look back, uh, a look at some of the other technologies, the other concepts, the other philosophies that exist and, and how they've influenced what we're doing today. So I'd like to start with this idea that user-centered design makes things better. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with this concept. User-centered design fundamentally is about designing products for the users who will actually use the products, right? Designing with the users in mind. So they do this uh, with a philosophy and a methodology that includes actually talking to users, doing rapid prototypes, right? Trying things out, trying things on paper, doing interviews, having iterations, really changing things and always keeping the user at the center of the design process. Okay, this goes back to the 70s. Uh, Mike referenced some of the guys who were the forefathers of this whole methodology. And it's helped drive websites into this world of Web 2.0, right? We end up with websites that are simpler in terms of look and feel. They're intuitive in terms of how we use them. And they're familiar to us. UCD, this user-centered design principle, is all around us. And it's usually the basis for the products that we love to use. Right? The ones we keep referencing as great examples of design. 
They're designed well because they're designed with your needs in mind. They're designed from your perspective. So can we apply this idea that's worked in the past, this idea that's produced great products? We talk about APIs as products. Can we apply a UCD, a user-centered design methodology, to this world? Right? And we can, but I think we need to identify the differences here. Our product is a different type of product. Our users are a specific group of users. We're working with developers who engage initially, develop a client application, then possibly disengage until something goes wrong. There's aspects of this that we need to understand. We need to develop a, a developer-centered design approach, right? a DCD type of methodology. So I don't have one to show you, but we've been working on this internally at Layer 7, trying to establish what we can take from there and put together so that API designers can think in the right way from the beginning. Right? So it involves starting by identifying your audience, figuring out who you're making this API for. Right? We all want serendipity and people to build anything and everything. But if you build the API with a, a user base in mind, platforms in mind, you can start making appropriate design decisions, choosing your architecture based on usage. Right? And ultimately prototyping, just like UCD, rapid prototyping, testing, changing it as necessary. You know, if we're going to treat it like a product, an API, let's treat it as a, a product that's designed great. So this is possible. Also, if we look at the past, removing barriers have always increased adoption, right? Websites can teach us a lot about how to register users. Websites face the challenge of taking guest users and turning them into registered users, right? They want to turn someone who has a, a very low engagement model, someone who's just a visitor, into someone who has a user ID, someone who's provided information. And they need to do this for monetization, to provide additional functionality to gain information about their audience. We have the same needs in the web API space, right? We want developers to come in and get engaged, register with us and use our APIs. So what can we learn from the websites of the world? Well, they figured out that first they need to communicate the value of registering, right? You need to show a user why they should take an action. And we need to do the same thing when we design API management solutions. We need to show prospective developers and users what they would get from using the API. What's in it for them, right? <coughs> we need to make it easy to sign up. If you're registering and you have a thousand fields to fill out, you're less likely to move forward, right? The same is true for web APIs. We need instant feedback. If I register for something, I want to know right away whether it worked or not, right? I don't want to have to wait two weeks for a human process to kick off and to get a result. It's an identical situation. You know, number four, we need to make policies clear. If you look at um, design principles for registration on websites, on website design, they state, you know, call out your terms and conditions. <coughs> what are your data privacy uh, terms? And the reason we need to do this is to address any fears that people have, remove those barriers. You know, it's an identical situation for us in the API design world. If you're thinking from a developer perspective, what are those things that are stopping them from using an API right away? What are they worried about? And can we call those out and you know, provide that information up front? And lastly, we want to use uh, lazy registration. Okay, in the website world, this means allowing a user to use your site as much as possible up until the point they need to register. Right? So effectively, you engage, 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 up to the point where they have to put some small amount of effort to continue being engaged. From a web API management perspective, this means we want developers to be able to learn all about your API, even use your API, before they need to commit to you know, registering an application registering themselves. So we lose some information, right? We lose some analytics. But the worst thing I can think of is, uh, you know, visiting an API portal and having to register in order to even look at the documentation. 
right? That's not effective, it's not gonna work, and it hasn't worked in the past. Learn these lessons. You're not the first one to try and figure out how to engage users. It's been done in the past, so apply these lessons. Ultimately, all of this comes to the point of friction, right? We know from website design that frictionless processes are good. And they're good for API management as well. The other thing we figured out is that security is really, it's a war, right? It's not a, a problem that you just solve and walk away. It's a constant, constant battle. Perfect security is absolutely not possible. We've learned that as well, right? There's no one who can sell you security. There's no way for you to make your systems unbreakable. All you can try and achieve is a practical level of security. Can you secure your systems enough that it becomes impractical for someone else to gain anything from it? We've seen in websites, you know, we use TLS and, and SSL for uh, privacy and for server authentication, right? Usernames and passwords for authentication. And in the SOA and web services world, TLS for data privacy and a suite of WS specifications for enabling security. So we can take these things and apply them, and we apply them in different ways to the API space. But I think uh, the lesson we really need to take away is using that didn't stop things like this from happening. Right? This is the OWASP, OWASP top 10 list. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. If you're not, become familiar with it. Right? This is based on the observations of people within the web application world. And these are the top 10 ways that people break websites and gain access. I think every single one of these is applicable to our world. Right? We don't need to relearn this the hard way. These lessons have been learned. We need to apply what's been learned. Right? And you know, in terms of is SSL good enough, is it enough to just secure the connection into your API? It's not. Right? There needs to be more. There needs to be some level of understanding of what you're doing. You need to configure SSL properly. This is a lesson that's been learned. We need to use secure implementations. You know, every six months someone writes an article about how SSL is not infallible because people are using libraries the wrong way. They're not understanding certificates. You need to take it seriously, and you need to constantly keep track of what's happening in the security side. <coughs> so that's control. But what website design has also taught us is that too much control can impact usability. Right? So if we think about things like password policies, if you create a new account in a website, and the password policy is incredibly difficult, that's friction, and you're less likely to use that site. I think from the SOA world, we, we didn't think that way necessarily. Right? I know from working in that space, it was security architects uh, demanding a level of security, and we enforced it. I think what we can learn in the web API space is you know, websites have to balance things. We can't drive users away. We need to really balance control with usability. And we see evidence of that with the way OAuth has grown. Right? We could probably do 30 minutes on OAuth and the debate about whether it's suitable or not. But one thing that's for sure, as we went from OAuth 1 to OAuth 2, it became easier for developers to use. Right? And this is a key point that we should all learn. We want security, but we don't want it at the expense of usability. We also know that hypermedia can make life easier. And it's true, right? It's trivial examples. The World Wide Web is based on this concept. The, the way we surf websites, we use links to travel from page to page, to go from piece of information to another piece of information. We use forms to manage how we provide data to the server. Right? All of this exists, but somehow, it hasn't translated to our web API space easily. Right? 
Now, there's going to be other sessions over the next two days if you want to dive deeper into the hypermedia side, right? But all I'm saying is we should be able to take aspects of this world right now, today. It doesn't have to be the API of the future. Things like links, they make sense. They're proven to be effective. And we should be able to apply those today within API design. We also know that uh, documentation is a craft, right? It's something that requires focus because we talk about web APIs and we call them APIs. But before all of this started, you know, 10, 11 years ago, APIs were those language dependent libraries that you installed and you used. So, what did they do? How did they provide instructions for the libraries that users installed? You know, we can learn a lot about documentation for web APIs by looking at the art of API documentation. And I think it's, it's funny that, you know, I'm not, I don't know if it's people in this room, but I've certainly worked with customers who are surprised to find out that there's a wealth of information on how to document APIs, right? It's a, a full profession in itself. There's so much to learn in there. And it really comes down to, you know, the central theme of thinking like a developer, taking this user-centric approach and developing your information in a way that it makes sense for them, right? Making information accessible and referenceable, non-linear, using small nuggets of information that are easy to digest, and thinking task-based, right? These are the things that have made traditional API documentation good, and we can apply all of that. Good documentation ultimately improves usability. We'll get higher adoption if we document effectively. And examples are the real meat here, right? Examples are like illustrations. We want to use a lot of them. I haven't heard yet anyone complaining about too much examples, right, or too many examples. So also, this is a, a little bit vague. We'll drill in here. Effective management is critical. Okay, and this is a lesson we've learned, I think, primarily from SOA governance. So I've been involved in this space as well. And I know that SOA governance, you know, this is the short form. Any slide about SOA governance is usually very long. But in summation, it's about enforcing some form of access control, promoting usage, right, promoting usage of services providing discovery documents, a library of artifacts, and providing some sense of visibility of what's happening. On the surface, that's pretty similar to API management. Right? We see a lot of the same type of ideas. Enforce access control. Promote usage, but this time API usage. Provide API documentation instead of discovery documents and provide usage visibility. It's the same general idea. But I really think that SOA governance is rooted in a different area. It answers a slightly different question. To me, SOA governance kind of arose to answer the question of how do we make sure that the services we have are used properly? Right. One of the things I noticed with SOA is we started to see a, a proliferation of services within organizations. And customers were looking for ways to control how those services were used. Right. So how do we ensure reuse? Because people keep creating new services and then instead of reusing the existing one, they use that second service. To me, this was the crux of the problem that was being solved. I feel like API management evolved differently. To me, API management evolved in the you know, open API space, addressing the question of how do we make sure we continue to allow usage without falling over? How do we drive adoption and support adoption while keeping our resources controlled and safe? It's a, it's a small difference, but I think it's significant in that it describes the, the real nature here of a controlled system versus an organic system, right? How did we get to these points? 
when I look at that SOA space, you know, it's to me a world of centralized rules of uh, architects who make decisions and then they're carried forth. There's a real opportunity for us in that large business world, in the enterprise world, to learn the lessons of organic systems, right? Not necessarily to become organic, but organic systems that develop in this way where it's not a, a mandated policy, but you know, we see survival of the fittest, API publishers competing against other API publishers to get the most adoption. It creates a level of efficiency. It creates a level of innovation that we can learn from. But what can we learn from SOA governance in the API management world? Well, I think one thing is, you know, we can really represent organizations effectively with SOA governance, right? And that's something that's not always present in API management solutions. Especially if you're building private APIs for B2B integration, you need that additional metadata. And we can take that from the, the governance world. I think complexity sucks, and I think that there's a lot of it in SOA governance. Right? In, a, in these organic systems that developed, they're simple, they're focused, they solve specific problems. And, and a lot of times, SOA governance solutions try and solve massive problems across an entire organization and lose that focus. Right? So if we're going to do management or governance, whatever you want to call it, you need small, bite-sized pieces that solve real problems. Right? And we need to focus on the user. We don't force users to use tools. We use tools that users want to use. That's the only way to be effective. So lastly, I think we've also learned abstraction saves time and effort right, over the last 12, 14 years in terms of architecture. And I'm talking from a, a real implementation perspective, not from a, uh, you know, a REST uh, theory perspective. So in SOA, we had ESBs. They were useful, I think. A little bit complicated, but useful. And they did useful things for us, right? Transformation and content-based routing, logging and security enforcement. They were useful because they abstracted these pieces off to uh, another component. So we were able to focus on implementation without duplicating this kind of uh, operational functionality. Particularly, offloading security functionality makes sense. Okay? We touch on the fact that security is difficult. It's like a war. You don't want to have to focus on building great APIs as well as staying up to date on everything to do with security. Right? If you can offload this, you're in better shape. It's hard to do security correctly. And we learned that lesson from the web services and web app worlds. We should be applying it to the web API space as well. We've also learned that if you offload parts of your interface, right, you can gain a better level of consistency. If you're going to deploy more than one API in your organization, or if you're going to have pockets of teams, if you're in a federated environment where different people develop different APIs, you don't want to provide all of those different interfaces to developers. Right? You need consistent interfaces to stay simple, to stay familiar, uh, and API proxies, API gateways, whatever you want to call the product, can help with that. Right? So this idea of abstraction is useful and it's effective. So in summary, there's, there's real goal to be found if we look backwards. If we look at what's come before, we can apply those lessons, but we can't simply lift and drop. Right? We can't cut and paste. We have to uh, adapt these lessons to the web API space we're working in. And I think the central theme that we can take away, you know, if it's not just about technology, and it's not just about being open, to me this viewpoint, this idea that we're designing interactions from a developer perspective, right? We're focused on the interaction itself. Not the service, not the, the model, not the data, not the code. It's the interaction that's the key. Uh, to me, this is the perspective that we need to capture. Okay. Thank you.